we're going to look today at another in another message of prophetic views of scripture but today we're going to see that Jesus is a prophesied gift from God in Christ God gave a sign we'll see in Isaiah 7 God gave a son we'll see that in Isaiah chapter 9 and God gave a savior king we'll see that in Luke chapter 2 so first of all take your Bible and turn it to the book of Isaiah chapter 7 we'll certainly not be addressing the entire portion of the chapter but we want to focus on the fact that God gave a sign let's pray Thank you for the gift of eternal life, Father, that comes through your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King. Thank you for the work of your Spirit. Father, take this time, and in those who know Christ Jesus as Savior, may your Spirit bring about understanding may your spirit illuminate for the person who doesn't know Christ as Savior Father we only ask that in grace and in mercy that you would work in that heart and bring that person to saving faith in Christ for Jesus sake we pray Amen when we talk about giving <clears throat> pretty sure y'all that I've related this before but in the book Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington he, he writes to say that in the course of establishing raising funds, establishing and maintaining the Tuskegee Institute he had to rub shoulders with rulers of other nations as well as many wealthy and influential people but at one point in the book he he mentions that one of the most touching things that ever happened to him in his life was a woman who was well along in her years she was an old woman but she brought a half dozen eggs to him and she said this is what i have to donate use them as you wish I wanted to go to help your boys and girls giving I read somewhere one time that <clears throat> a little illustration that said if we want to be rich we learn to give if we want to be poor we grasp everything we have if we want to learn abundance then be willing to scatter if we want to become needy then we practice hoarding everything we have. In Jesus Christ, God is the perfect example to us of giving. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Jesus is the prophesied gift in a sign. Isaiah has come to King Ahaz. <clears throat> with a message from the Lord and Ahaz has refused the offer but, but God speaks through the prophet and says therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel the Lord would give a sign God was long suffering in giving the prophecy of this sign when it says therefore <clears throat> Isaiah had been sent to comfort Ahaz we can read that in verses 3 and 4 the Lord said to Isaiah go forth to meet Ahaz you and Shirjashu your son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field Say to him, take heed and be quiet. Do not fear, neither be faint-hearted. 
and on it goes. That, that boy's name meant, meant a remnant shall return. And Isaiah took that son of his along because there was a message to be conveyed to Ahaz. Isaiah was sent to convince, not only to comfort, but to convince Ahaz. And if we read Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 7, it simply states, Thus says the Lord, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. It isn't going to happen. It was intended to comfort and to convince this message that Isaiah had. If we would turn to 2 Kings chapter 16 and verse 7, we would read there that Ahaz already had his own plan for, for allying himself with Assyria in order to gain the protection that he thought he was going to have. And yet God persisted to do his very best for his people. Another thing that we see about this sign, that God was gracious. Therefore, looking at the long suffering, the Lord himself will give you a sign. God was going to be very gracious because Ahaz flatly refused. In fact, is he, he spoke in a very insulting way to the prophet as to God's great offer. Ahaz and the people did not deserve, and still God gave. These first two points that we can observe here give us a good lesson in learning to deal with other people. Sometimes we have to be very patient, very long-suffering in our patience in dealing with people. Take your Bible. And look at what Paul says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 will illustrate this point. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them who are unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, support the weak, be patient toward all. See that none render evil for evil to any man, but ever follow what is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Consider Barnabas and Paul going their different ways in the book of Acts. And it was because they had different viewpoints toward Barnabas' nephew, Mark. Barnabas takes this young man and instructs him and teaches him. And later on, Paul realizes that the young man, Mark, has matured greatly, and especially in the spiritual realm, and asks for him. David, in dealing with King Saul, Twice he had opportunity to kill King Saul, and he refused to do so. And y'all, it's also important for us to remember there are some people in our lives with whom it's more difficult to learn to love them, to learn to deal with them, than others. In Matthew chapter 20, would you look there, please? Matthew chapter 20 and verse 26. Jesus has responded because James and John had made the request of being given a position in the kingdom and the other disciples are rather indignant about it. Jesus says it will not be so among you. Whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Paul says to the Philippians, Look not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. 
And he there is not telling us to become nosy or to be busy body with other people, but to be concerned about one another. Coming back to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 in, in Jesus Christ being prophesied as a gift, it tells us also that God was faithful. He said, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. And this word sign is a token of, to assure somebody a pledge of fidelity. See, God's going to be faithful to his covenant right here. To his people Judah. To King Ahaz for as wicked and as terrible as King Ahaz was. And, and, and as much as he perverted the values of the nation. God is going to be faithful and remember his covenant for Jesus Christ's sake God continues to be faithful to keep us to to bring us to final delivery in our lives Paul says to the Thessalonians faithful is he who calls you who also will do it he says to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 that he was confident of this very thing, he says to them that he who has begun a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And consider also Philippians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 where Paul says that God's spirit has been given to minister to us as a down payment, as, a, as an earnest, that what he says he's going to do to, to deliver us to, final, to the final product that he has in mind for us is the proof in as much as the Spirit of God is at work changing us right now. That is God's evidence. Now take your Bible and turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 6 and 7. Not only is Jesus prophesied as a sign, but Jesus is prophesied, is the prophesied gift of a son. He's the prophesied gift of a sign. He's the prophesied gift of a son. It tells us in Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and with righteousness, righteousness from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, as Isaiah points out, so in chapter 7, so he's pointing out here in these two verses, this son is God himself. He says, Emmanuel, in chapter 7, and verse 14, God with us. Here, in this verse, he says that this son is the mighty God, the everlasting father. And remember, y'all, and, and I believe that we saw this last week, we made mention of this last week, when we talk about Jesus Christ as the Son of God, we understand He's the Son of God in the sense of the prophecies being God Himself, Jehovah in flesh. Now, what He says about the prophesied gift of this son is, first of all, he would come as an infant. Uh, Israel's Messiah was not going to come as a full-grown man such as God did when he created Adam. He's going to come as an infant. A child is born. An infant would be helpless, 
need of protection. Remember in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13 when Herod finally has it brought to his attention by the wise men and such that this is the king of the Jews who's been born. He sends out this decree to kill all the male children up to a certain age. And God's spirit warns Joseph in a dream, you've got to flee to Egypt. <clears throat> so Joseph and Mary take the Lord Jesus and away they go. They had to escape Herod. Our Lord is this infant needed protection. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 51, it talks about his growing up. And it tells us <clears throat> that he was subject to his parents. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus here is answering. The disciples came to him and said, Who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say to you, except you're converted and become as little children, you'll not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, himself as this little child, the same as the greatest, the kingdom of heaven. The heart of the child is the attitude of heart that Jesus said he was expected for those who would inhabit his kingdom. The child, very needy of protection and care and such. Jesus Christ would come as a child. Second thing about the gift of this son, he would be the one needful to continue in David's line, namely a son. The heritage of the kingship generally was going to be passed down through sons. Now, we're going to examine a couple portions that deal with the covenant that God made with David. First of all, in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16, where God makes the promise that a ruler would come in the line of David who would rule forever, we see there that it's stated in a general way, but y'all look at 2 Chronicles chapter 28. 2 Chronicles chapter 28. Verses 6 and 7, I believe. No, I'm sorry. First Chronicles. Second Chronicles wasn't going to make any sense. First Chronicles, chapter 28. Verses 6 and 7. David is relating what the Lord had said to him. He said to me, Solomon, your son, shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he's constant to do my commandments, my ordinances, as at this day. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Davidic covenant, the covenant with David is stated in a general way and David is told there will be someone after your line who will rule forever. This we know is the person of Jesus Christ and Peter in his message in uh, Acts chapter 2 points this out. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, God makes it very clear that the opportunity, because of being the chosen one in David's line, rests on Solomon. But notice the condition. If he's constant to do my commandments, my ordinances, as at this day. And of course we know Solomon did not. 
Now coming back to Isaiah chapter 9, we notice that this son would be ruler. Ruler in David's line, and that's the importance of the phrase, in the, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now back in Isaiah chapter 2, and I want us to turn there, Isaiah chapter 2, verse, <coughs> excuse me, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, down through verse 4, we see the extent of this king. It shall come to pass in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many peoples, and they'll beat their swords to plowshares and their spears to pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Here's the extent, the impact of the king. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, particularly verses 4 and 5, and we see the character of the one who will rule this kingdom. With righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked and the righteous shall be the girdle of the righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his waist. It tells us back in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 of the superiority of this one who will rule. Consider Matthew chapter 2 verses 4 through 6 when the wise men come to Jerusalem and they're asking, where is he that's born king of the Jews? Herod's very troubled, but he doesn't have the answer. And he gathers the scribes. He gathers the Jewish leaders together. And they know. They tell him it's in Bethlehem, Judah. Because they say it's written by the prophet. Now I want us to turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 31. Now in Matthew chapter 1, when the angel appears to Joseph, he simply reminds him, you'll call his name Jesus, for he'll save his people from their sins. But there's something more that's spoken to Mary. Luke chapter 1 and verse 31, it says, Behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and will call his name Jesus. That, of course, means Jehovah is salvation. But notice what he goes on to say. He shall be great, shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom shall be no end. And this is referencing what the prophet Isaiah said. As ruler, this king is a reminder that Jesus Christ deserves priority in our lives. Think about Luke chapter 2 when the angelic announcement comes to the shepherds, they respond immediately to go see this that has come to pass. And they're going to see the Messiah who's been born. <clears throat> they're not spending their time being awestruck. Of course, they first were. But once they receive this message, they aren't staying around wondering about 
the angelic announcement to them, they immediately take off. They want to go see this child. The wise men, on the night Jesus was born, saw the star and, and departed. A year later, or at least a year, if not more, they arrive in Jerusalem. They question Herod. They're sent out with the message that he's in Bethlehem. And what's their objective? To see Jesus. Not Joseph. Certainly not Mary. And they weren't concerned about Herod. They were warned about Herod and went in another direction. The Lord Jesus deserves this priority. I'm going to the book of John chapter 15. John chapter 15, <clears throat> our Lord says, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, and that whatever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. That, of course, doesn't mean a blank check. It means that which is in accord with the will of God, namely found in the scripture. But Jesus says, these things I command you that you love one another. He, he will say later on, if you love me, keep my commandments. As a ruler, as a king that's being prophesied here, it's a reminder to us of the priority that our Lord Jesus deserves in our lives. I mean, think of it someday when Jesus rules his earthly kingdom for a thousand year, years. Every nation, the kingdom will come to a point that every nation will have compulsion to gather to hear his instruction. Now take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Luke, chapter 2. Luke, chapter 2. And we see that Jesus is the prophesied gift of a Savior King. Luke, chapter 2, and verse 10. The angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. This Savior King was going to be a... a the, the sign was about him. That's how I want to say this. They said, this is going to be your sign. You'll see him in, in this fashion. Well, why does verse 13, or why does verse 12 say, this will be a sign to you? Because the Savior, the King, God himself, Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, God himself, the ruler after David's line and the savior, the grandeur, the majesty, the fanfare that surrounds this announcement. And where are they going to find him? In a manger, in the feeding trough for the animals. Someone as noble, as spectacular in birth as the Lord Jesus Christ the reason that it was assigned was because he was going to be in such humble surroundings. Paul says to Timothy when he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Y'all just stop and ponder that had the Lord Jesus come into majestic surroundings, who would ever have accepted the fact that he was the Savior that was sent into the world? No. This Savior King 
was going to be the, the sign of this Savior King was going to relate to where he would be found. And then when we come into the scripture and we learn that he that he suffered the things we did, he understood us as a as a great and faithful high priest. We look at the account of the scripture, even right down in his birth, and we say, yes, understand that. The Lord Jesus, excuse me. The Lord Jesus and, some, and most of us can quote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Only Christ is the offer of salvation to whosoever, anyone. A lot of people in this time of the season are going to be attending church services perhaps or listening to religious programs. And many people are going to think, I'm so bad, I've done so many wrong things, God doesn't want me. Scripture says, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the book of Romans chapter 3, if you want to turn there, please. In the book of Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, it tells us that only Jesus Christ is the answer for the righteousness which God expects in those who belong to him, who will inhabit his heaven someday. It tells us in Romans 3, 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there's no difference. Now the angel told Matthew, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And the Lord Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them who believe on his name. And praise the Lord, this included Gentiles. In Jesus Christ, God spoke to the prophets and gave a sign, a son, and a savior king. There's a free gift that has been offered of eternal life through Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is your savior, serve him. If he is not, then we invite you to put your faith in Christ as the only one by whom you can have the righteousness that God demands. It's not, heaven is not achieved by being in a church nor doing the best we can nor being able to say that we've lived a good life or that our good is going to outweigh our bad, hopefully comes only through faith in Christ we invite you to in now Father we just ask that you would take whatever's spoken in this your word and let the truths of scripture rest upon hearts may your spirit work as he sees fit for Jesus sake. Amen